Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, that was a musical piece. That was... <laughs> It was a ringtone composed by the Israeli composer who lives in America, Shulamit Ran, and it's number two of her ringtone suite, which is part of a greater project um, dedicated to the composition of ringtones for string quartet, uh, um, commissioned by a quartet in Chicago and participated uh, in the participation of uh, a number of uh, successful composers in the United States and, uh, and out of the United States as well. Uh, the project, which is a, a lovely project in itself, is also interesting in that it, it makes us think for a moment about the role of short pieces in our lives today, a role that we practically take for granted. Because when we wake up in the morning, from the moment we, are, we wake up in the morning until we go to bed at night, our day is a sequence of small, miniature musical works, and behind each and every one of the sounds that we hear, whether it's the alarm clock that, uh, that we hear when we wake up in the morning, or whether it's the, uh, uh, the, the sound that we receive when we check our email on our phone before we even get out of bed, and, and when we switch on the computer and so on, each and every one of these has a composer behind it who presumably gave the sounds that we're about to hear some thought. And therefore, each and every one of them is a musical work. In some cases, we can choose which musical work we prefer to have. So some of us might choose... And that's a good opportunity to remind anyone who's forgotten to switch it off, <laughs> to switch it off so that that is the only r r real ringtone that we hear in this concert. Perhaps, to, to make the point a little clearer, um, I would like to focus on a particular type of short piece that we encounter every time we switch on the computer and, and to, to check what kind, what kind of a thought composers give to these, um, to these little musical works. So let's start off with Windows 3.1 in the early days of computers. Then, when we'd switch on our computer, we'd get... Ha! ta -da! <laughs> We managed! You managed! Wow! A few years later, Windows 95, well, nobody's all that excited anymore about managing to switch on their computer. In fact, we're beginning to understand how computers are taking over our lives, how they're causing us quite a lot of stress. So Windows 95, come float with us on a cloud and relax. This was composed by Brian Eno. They must have paid him a huge sum uh, to compose this. When we move further into Windows 98, well, now they're looking for the kind of cutting-edge technology that Windows is giving you, something that could not possibly have been created on Earth. It must have come from outer space. Take me to your leader. <laughs> there it comes. You can even see the Windows symbol. It sort of comes in from outer space. We move forward to um, Windows XP, the worker who's uh, who, the high-tech and uh, the high-tech employee is sitting in his little cubicle and he would really like to have a window to look out of but instead all he's got is a windows in front of him so they're going to give him a kind of a sense of open space and note how the picture gives that that gives us that open space as well and to get to the very very last of these musical works this sequence of musical works the Ninth Symphony, or perhaps Tenth, because it's Windows 10. Well, this is clean. It's straight from IKEA catalog. So the point of this really is to show us that these tunes, that these uh, that these little sounds that we take for granted, are musical works in their own right. And what we're going to do in this concert is we're going to look at the concept of a short musical work, and we're going to trace it from the uh, from its earliest days until the present and see the different reasons, the various reasons for writing a short musical work. Actually, music and literature march hand in hand in, uh, in this respect because both of them from their very earliest days started off with short works. Has anyone got an idea why the first, um, the first musical works that were written down and the first literary works that were written down were so short? Yeah. 
<laughs> paper is expensive. Well, not quite. Well, we're getting closer, yes. I mean, there was a reason paper is expensive, and, or at least not common. There were no printing presses, yes. But it's more than that. Well, what they were doing is they were recording oral traditions. And oral traditions can only be so long. You can only tell a short story. You, you can't have an oral tradition that, that gives you war and peace. Uh, but an oral tradition can give you a short, a short story that you can remember. Um, an oral tradition can give you a tune that's, that, uh, that the bard can, that can sing to the next bard on and, uh, and so on. So the earliest pieces that were recording short, um, that were recording tradition, these earliest pieces had to be short. The earliest literary works, for instance, are a, um, usually a sort of concatenation of such stories. Take, for instance, um, the Metamorphoses by Ovid, a series of short stories which each one of them is, is an independent story in its own right, and they just have this theme of metamorphoses that links them together, that knits them together. And if we move forward to the 14th century, to the Decameron by Boccaccio, or the Canterbury Tales by Chaucer, there again we have a series of short stories all of which were traditional stories or jokes that people would tell at the time, which uh, Boccaccio or Chaucer then wrote down carefully and, and, um, and composed literally. And then they were knit into this framework, whether it's the people who are retiring into uh, a villa nearby Florence to get away from the plague in the Decameron, or whether it's the pilgrims on their way um, to a pilgrimage who sit down and tell each other tales in the Canterbury Tales. But the Stories can do very well without their context. The earliest musical instrument, instrumental musical works also had this character. They were collections of independent works that were not really meant to be performed as a whole. For instance, Michael Pretorius, the great German composer of the late 16th and early 17th century, wrote a piece of music called Terpsichore. Terpsichore is a collection of dances, and there are about 330 dances there very short dances, which he collected from different places and wrote down and, and arranged brilliantly. But these dances could not and would not have been performed as a whole. You would select whatever you wanted. They were recording things that he found. They were um, designed to help people um, who needed dances, to give them dances to play. But each one of these works was a work in its own right, and the whole was not meant to be performed as such. Let's hear one of these lovely dances by Michael Pretorius. Gorgeous little pieces, each and every one of them, and in every single recording that you'll hear of Terpsichore, you'll hear a different selection, because that's what they were meant for, a selection. The literary works of the, of the time, at the early 17th century, started developing and started um, trying to knit these small stories together in a way that they couldn't really be separated so well. So if you look at the picaresque novel, the, the best of example of which is uh, Don Quixote uh, by Cervantes, there you can see both a framework of a story from beginning to end. Unlike the Decameron or the Canterbury Tales, it's the same protagonist from the beginning to end, and he goes through a process from beginning to end. But each and every one of the episodes is a story within its own right. So it's somewhere in, in between the novel, the modern novel, and the collection of stories that we had at the beginning. Um, at the same time, the 
suite of dances was also developing into a piece of music that had to be played from beginning to end, the, the dance suite. And the dance suite had a uh, regular a set sequence of dances, starting with an allemande, moving to a courant, going on to a sarabande. It was more or less sent, uh, set, and everyone knew that when you get to the jig, uh, jig, then you're right at the end. So it gave them a sense of where they were within the work. And it really didn't make all that much sense to take a single movement and perform it by itself, or at least less sense. Uh, so these things are happening at the same time in music and in literature. And the next stage, of course, is moving on to the uh, to, to where you, can, you can't separate a, a single movement at all. For instance, in the um, string quartet or the symphony, which develops into this four movement set um, series of movements where you really have to play everything from beginning to end to understand what it's all about. Take Beethoven's Ninth, for instance. You couldn't possibly understand the last movement that quotes all the movements beforehand without having heard the movements beforehand. The modern novel did the same thing. The earliest modern novels still had a little bit of that sort of um, sense of episodes, whether it's Tom Jones um, or Vanity Fair. Well, Vanity Fair really is more, more of a through-composed novel. So you're already arriving in the 18th century, towards the end of the 18th century, at novels that really can't be separated at all, and you have to read them from beginning to end. So the question must be asked, if we now have musical works or a novel um, that can only be taken as a whole, then what do we do with incomplete musical works or with incomplete literary works or with incomplete works of art? Well, with works of art, the answer is quite simple. We can still appreciate them, and they're even quite an inspiration to us. Take, for instance, the Belvedere Torso, a uh, very famous sculpture which is in the Vatican. I looked on their site, it's from, the, uh, from either the first century BC or, uh, or the first century um, to, um, after Christ, but um, I, I'm not sure exactly why, why they're not sure whether it's before or after, I mean, it's quite a long time. Perhaps the artist signed um, first century and they just weren't sure whether it was BC or... No. <laughs> In any case, this is one of the most inspiring of all sculptures of all time. Michelangelo spent hours sitting in front of the Belvedere torso and both learning from the power that it, uh, that it gives us, but also imagining how he could possibly have um, completed it himself. There were, himself. There were all sorts of dip, uh, little um, hints that one could get from it. For instance, if you look, this is um, the, the torso from behind, you can see he's sitting on an animal skin. So who was this? It, was, it, was it Hercules? Was it Samson? Was it Ajax? Who was it exactly? Um, they presume that it, that it was probably Ajax, actually, but, but then you're never quite sure, and everyone can really fill, fill it in with their Im imagination. So an incomplete work is an inspiring work in a very, very unique kind of way. And Michelangelo, indeed, took this a as an inspiration for um, St. Bartholomew in the Final Judgment, which is also there in the Vatican. Um, you can see the resemblance immediately. And many years later, Auguste Rodin used it as the inspiration for his famous um, thinker. With uh, musical works, of course, we, there are a number of famous cases where incomplete musical works were also completed later. Um, what is the most famous example? The, yeah, the Mozart Requiem. And uh, the Mozart Requiem was left incomplete at the time of his death and was completed at first for commercial reasons. His wife wanted to sell it, so she gave it to um, a student of his to complete. And later on, other completions are, um, were done for artistic reasons. The same with Mozart's Mass. These pieces are there and they, they beg to be brought to complete form and they, they allow composers nowadays to feel as if they were Mozart for a short while. So they're really, the, the incomplete work is a, an inspiration within itself. But Haydn's quartet, Opus 103, is one of the incomplete works that nobody will attempt to complete. And the reason for that is that Haydn wrote two full movements and didn't leave us any hint about what he meant to do in any of the other movements. Let's roll back a bit. The work itself was written in 1803, but I want to take a step back to 1799, when Haydn wrote his two quartets, Opus 77, number one, and number two, um, one of which we are going to play in the last concert this year. So that's a, a quiet advertisement for the last concert. Um, 
Those two works are wonderful pieces, but unlike most of Haydn's string quartets, he never completed them to the standard set of six quartets. And there are many guesses as to why he didn't complete them. Um, some people think perhaps that it was because um, Beethoven's Opus 18 quartets were published the same year, and Haydn realized that he was no longer fashionable. But nevertheless, four years later, in 1803, Haydn made another attempt at writing a string quartet. This was a string quartet, Opus 103, and he wrote two movements, a, one movement in moderate pace and one movement which was a minuet. So we're not quite sure whether the moderate paced movement was meant to be the first movement or whether it was meant to be the second slow movement. Um, and we're not sure whether the minuet was meant to be second or third. It could have been in either place. We think that perhaps it was the second and third movements. Uh, but in any case, after, the, after writing the minuet, Haydn wrote a small signature at the bottom of the text. Um, and the signature was, in fact, a set of musical notes, a sort of riddle that we had to, um, that we had to uh, work out. Um, those notes were the text of a song that Haydn had written earlier that year to the words, I am old, I no longer have any strength. Um, Haydn felt that he could no longer write the, the string quartet, and in fact, this is his last um, attempt at writing a full-scale work. He wrote a few um, arrangements of songs afterwards, but in the remaining six years of his life, he never wrote a single um, large-scale work. Um, the song, I am old and, uh, and I have no strength, is a lovely song. Let's just hear the beginning of that song. As you can see, Haydn, with no strength, can still do a lot better than I can. <laughs> um, it's a lovely song, and it really gives us a taste of, of Haydn's joy, um, the great joy of life, one that we still hear, even in the quartet, Opus 103, where he was feeling sort of too old to write it. Now, Haydn decided, despite having not completed the quartet, to give it an ending that really sounded like an ending. So the second movement, which would normally have been in the middle of the piece and was a minuet, which you usually finish with a sort of graceful bow. Here, he finishes it off with a very impressive passage on the first violin, which suits the end of a piece. So in a way, despite being a fragment, Haydn has given us a complete fragment, one that starts in a convincing way and ends the way a piece should end. Haydn's String Quartet, Opus 103. Thank you.
There was something prophetic about Haydn's decision to leave this piece in an, in, in an irregular form of two movements only, and nevertheless declare it a completed work. Because in the um, early 19th century, which was just when this was written, 1803, the piece, the piece was written, the early 19th century was the beginning of musical romanticism, when people were looking for a more individual type of expression, for a more personal type of expression, for more spontaneity. And when you're spontaneous, well, when you're spontaneous, you don't be spontaneous in four movements, and definitely not in four movements with set form. So those of you who were there in the last concert of, la of last season, in the concert where we played Beethoven's Opus 131, do you remember how many movements there were there? Seven, seven, seven movements. But, an, uh, but Opus 130 has six movements, um, other pieces have five, 132 has five. People were, were playing around with the, with the number of movements to show that, well, we don't want our, the way of our expression to be dictated to us. We want it to be natural, and we want to make it something that serves the purpose of a particular piece um, and the particular piece that we write. So we encountered many works with more movements than four, but also some movements with less movements than four. And in particular, the most natural form of expression was, of course, one single movement. If I have something to say, well, I'll just say it. I don't need to split it into separate movements. But when composers were looking for a model to base their one movement forms on, they had one obvious model that they could rely upon. Because not many works had one movement that was performed alone, but works that were, but operas tended to have a, an overture that was one complete movement that became very, very popular. So popular, in fact, that at times, due to the popularity of the opera, concerts would include just the overture of the opera and not the opera itself. So the audience started getting used to hearing the overture as a piece in its own right. Composers started having to compose overtures that would um, be overture, that would be pieces that could be performed as standalone pieces. And Beethoven, I suppose, is the, is the greatest example of this with the uh, Fidelio, the, the many Leonora overtures that he wrote and then discarded, um, but uh, discarded from the opera, but were kept as, as concert pieces in their own right. If we go later into the um, 19th century, then there we find overtures, which were, which were overtures to nothing at all. For instance, uh, Mendelssohn's overture to Midsummer Night's Dream was not written for the incidental music. The incidental music was written many years later. The overture was written at first as an overture, a piece that has a character that captures a mood, that captures the spirit of a literary work, and, and that was enough. It was an overture to nothing in particular, to itself. Um, the, another famous example is the Heb Hebrides, Fingal's Cave. That was, that was an overture that captures the um, atmosphere of a place, of the island in the, in the Hebrides in Scotland. And later on, literary works, um, well, they fed uh, Berlioz when he wrote King Lear or Le Corsaire. These are all single movement works that stand in their own right. Schubert's Quartetsatz is a little early on for, uh, for this kind of standalone overture, but I think it's an important step on the way. And we can't really ask Schubert why he left the Quartetsatz, um, which is the single quartet movement, why he left it as just one movement. But we can make a few guesses. A little background. Schubert, unlike Haydn, was not old when he wrote the Quartetsatz. It was written in 1820, when Schubert was only 23. And even though that was eight years before he died, um, he still had no idea that he was going to die so, so soon, and he was really at the peak of his powers. Nevertheless, Schubert wrote this immensely powerful first movement, and then wrote a little bit of a second movement, and then just sort of stopped and gave up. Now, of course, we can be very curious about what the second movement sounds like. Actually, there's no reason to be curious. Do you want to hear what he wrote? Yeah, yeah let's, let's have a go at it then.
That's all. <laughs> Well, one thing's clear, Schubert was not out of inspiration. He started writing a, a movement that could have developed to something perfectly good, and yet he decided to abandon it. Now, he may have felt that he had no good way to follow up the first movement, but I think it's more than that. And we, we can't really know the true answer, but we can guess. The first movement, I think Schubert felt, would be better off without any companion movement, would be better off as this burst of energy that is self-contained and that it really needs nothing else. And there's a few hints inside the music, that, uh, particularly in its structure, that suggest that Schubert may have really decided that it was better off on its own. To understand this, let's take a look at the themes inside the movement. The movement is written in sonata form, so that means that we have two main themes. And then we'll hear, we'll hear the first theme and then the second theme, and then they'll mix. Uh, he'll, he'll create a drama between the first theme and the second theme. And then, normally in sonata form, the first theme will reappear, and the second theme will reappear afterwards. So what is the first theme here? Well, it's not really a theme at all. It's more like a, a mood. It's sort of a descending four, four notes, dum, bum, 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 but with a shimmering texture. Let's hear the first, the explosion that starts off the piece, or the gradual, um, the gradual emergence which eventually explodes into the big bang that starts off this work. opening, but that's not a theme in the sense that Haydn's themes are themes. It's not a tune that has a beginning and an end. It's just something that suddenly erupts. The second theme, well, that's more like a theme. It's a lyrical, typically Schubertian, impossibly sweet melody played on the violin and also on the cello. <laughs> That sounds like a real theme. That's a way to start a piece. So we have this sort of thing that came at the beginning. It wasn't quite a first theme, and then this beautiful lyrical theme. What happens in the recapitulation, in other words, at the end, is that instead of go repeating these two themes in the original order, first the shimmering, descending theme, and then the lyrical one, Schubert does precisely the opposite. He goes first for the lyrical one, and then ends up with that eruption that we heard at the beginning, um, finishing off the piece with, those, with the notes that he started off with. So what we get is a symmetrical form, of sort of A, B, a middle, and then B, A. And those two A's, that shimmering thing that we had at the beginning, they work as a sort of brackets that wrap the piece into one whole and very, very cogent unit. I think that that kind of wholeness is what Schubert saw in this movement that made him decide not to complete the work. And as you'll see, the, the work itself is so powerful, even, it, even, it, even in its one movement form, that it really needs no companion. So ladies and gentlemen, Schubert's Quartetsatz. Thank you very much.
another one of Shulamit Run's ringtones, another reminder to switch off the cell phones who forever hasn't done that. Uh, but it also takes us back to the, um, to the beginning of this concert, where we describe the history of music as a history that goes from the short pieces to gradually um, to, to works that got gradually larger. And in fact, this continues throughout the 19th century. Pieces of music become longer and longer with uh, famous examples such as Beethoven's Eroica Symphony, which is already about 50 minutes long, um, Schubert's Ninth Symphony, which when Schumann discovered it, when Schumann found it, he looked at it and praised it for its heavenly length. There are some people who uh, prefer to call it the unfinishing symphony. <laughs> Later on, Mahler's symphonies can be as much as an hour and a half long or even more. So pieces of music get just longer and longer. And the same thing happens with works of literature too. The 19th century is really the century of these massive novels. The most famous example is, of course, War and Peace, right, but Middlemarch isn't all that short either. And David Copperfield is pretty long too, and so is The Count of Monte Cristo. Um, there are many examples of really long works of literature and long pieces of music written in the 19th century. But at the same time, something else was happening. Uh, alongside these very, very long works of, of literature, the short story started becoming popular. So. Washington Irving in America, and just after him, Edgar Allan Poe, later on, O. Henry. These are all English-speaking uh, or English-language authors, but we have von Kleist in Germany or Maupassant in France, uh, Turgenev and Chekhov in Russia. The 19th century was not only the century of the long pieces, it was also the century of the very short pieces. And in these short works, these short, um, short stories, well, an author really has no time. He's got to get straight to the point. So short stories don't start off with a history of the family, a few chapters telling us who the characters are and preparing us very slowly. It starts bang in the middle of the action. That's where we'll normally start off in a short story because there's no time and it's got to make a quick point. In musical pieces, we have the same thing because the 19th century did produce the longest symphonies, but it also produced the romantic miniature. Schubert was really one of the first to, um, to write miniatures systematically, the um, musical moments, Moments Musicales by, um, by Schubert, uh, a famous example, but also his um, Impromptu for, for piano. Um, and later on, Chopin became the really big master of the romantic miniature with his preludes, which are, as Richard Taruskin, the uh, famous musicologist once said, they are preludes to nothing and preludes to everything. Um, Tiny work, sometimes even half a minute long, at times four or five minutes long, but standalone pieces which just say what they want to say in a very short time, and that's it. They don't need anything that will come after them. Sadly, most of the romantic miniatures were written for the piano. Somehow the idea of a pianist, a solitary pianist, sitting at his piano and just sort of playing something spontaneous and walking off immediately afterwards appealed to composers more than a string quartet who come and must have rehearsed beforehand are clearly not improvising um, and definitely not a symphony orchestra so there are very few romantic miniatures for string quartet the few that were written were written by non-german composers some who stand outside the mainstream of string quartet composition so there's a series of miniatures written by uh, Dvořák for instance, called Cypresses. But the one that we're going to play to you is a miniature work by Puccini, the famous composer of operas. Um, very few people know it, but Puccini wrote a few works for string quartet, and the most commonly performed is the Chrysanthemi that he wrote in 1890, a work that was written in one burst of inspiration on one evening after he'd heard of the death of his close friend, the um, Duke of Savoy. So Puccini sat down and wrote this piece and, uh, in, in one sort of one um, burst of inspiration and, um, and one sentiment really rules the piece from beginning to end. We can hear at the beginning of the work this sort of sigh or an attempt to say something which ends with a oh, resignation, a sense of very, very deep sadness.
That's how the piece starts. We'd normally expect a, a, a musical sentence to finish that way. But no, it starts from the middle, like a short story. We, we, can, we've, we meet the composer at the height of his grief. In the middle of the movement, Puccini presents a beautiful singing theme, a, a lament. Puccini thought this theme was so beautiful, and I agree with him, that he decided to put it in one of his operas, an opera that he was writing at the same period, um, as a description of the death of Manon in Manon Lescaut. <laughs> There's nobody like Puccini, is there? I mean, he, he really gets to you. I, and <laughs> he does it despite any attempts that I might, might uh, make to, to, to stop him. I put up all my defenses when I hear Puccini. I, want him to, I, I don't want to allow him to get to me. I mean, it's cheap doing that. You shouldn't be able to get to me that way. And nevertheless, he gets through. Every time, the tears just start rolling. Um, well, th this piece, the Chrysanthemi, is one of the few romantic miniatures that we have. And, and it's called Chrysanthemi. Uh, few, sorry, a few romantic miniatures that we have for string quartet. It's called chrysanthemi because chrysanthemums in Italy are a sign of mourning. Um, people would put chrys chrysanthemums on, um, on graves and they would bring them to funerals. Um, and this piece is, in a way, a musical bouquet that uh, Puccini presented in the, in the memory of his deceased friend. Puccini's chrysanthemi, thank you very much.
Beautiful music, isn't it? Puccini continued to write such beautiful music well into the 20th century. In 1909, he wrote The Wild Rose of the, of the, wild, the wild Girl of the West, a, um, another romantic, beautiful opera. But in that same year, 1909, Anton Webern wrote the following notes. Wow. Those are the first four bars of the five pieces for string quartet by Anton Webern. And what we're going to try and do in the, remainder, in the remainder of this concert is to make sense out of Webern. It's to give you an, a, a way in to understand what it is that he was doing. Because really what was happening here is, is that seminal moment in the history of music, the moment where everything changed. There were, there were a number of people who were um, responsible for this big change, which we now call a, uh, the atonal period or the post-tonal period, or the period when music started sounding absolutely awful, depending on who you ask. <laughs> but there were a number of key figures there. One of them was Igor Stravinsky, and, well, he did it in 1913 with the Writer's Spring. And it's easy to like the Writer's Spring. There's a lot to connect to there, a lot of energy, a lot of good, fun romping that we can, that we can follow. And there were dancers on stage who also helped things out. And there was Bela Bartok, who used folk melodies to explore the um, other kinds of tonalities and a new atonality that he himself was creating. So he's also a little easier to connect to. But there were the three bad guys who really, until today, are considered the guys responsible, the guys who ruined it all. And those are Arnold Schoenberg, Anton Webern, and Alban Berg, um, three very great composers who called themselves the Second Viennese School. Now, the fact that they called themselves the Second Viennese School is very significant because they felt that despite the fact that they changed the way music speaks, and despite the fact that they were sounding completely different, well, they wanted to tell everyone, no, we have a strong connection to the first Viennese school. Now, who was in the first Viennese school? Mozart, Haydn, who we heard earlier, Beethoven, Schubert, who we heard earlier, and later on, Brahms. And it's very, very important to appreciate that these composers, the second Viennese school, really saw themselves as part of the same world, as something as they, they grew up writing romantic music. And in a way, their pieces, even the, those notes that you heard before and other notes within the piece, are inspired by the romantic, by the romantic language with, of course, some very significant changes. Um, to make the point clearer, let's just take a few measures from the middle of the first movement and hear what the first violin and second violin are playing there. Now, isn't that beautiful? That was Webern. It wasn't Brahms, it wasn't Mahler, it was Webern. Just beautiful, playing a lovely romantic duet. And at the same time, the viola has something beautiful to say in itself. So it's all very, very expressive. But I've been tricking you, because we heard them separately, and we heard me separately. So we didn't hear the dissonance. We didn't hear the clash. But what I want us to do now, when we listen to us playing it together, I want you to forget the dissonances. I want you to, to listen instead to the way, to, to the romanticism that you just heard, to the wonderful expression, uh, um, expressionism of Webern's music, the way he just says everything in the most romantic way possible even if, well, we have a few dissonances on the way. So let's hear that same moment, all of us together now.
That's beautiful, isn't it? So the Second Viennese School were not rebelling against Romanticism in the tonal sense. What they were really rebelling against, or at least this piece in, in, in particular, was something more specific, um, which was common to many composers and many artists of the time. What people felt uncomfortable with in the early years of the 20th century was with the excess of Romanticism, with the fact that Romanticism had everything, to, had so much to say, so loudly and so expensively and so and with such great lengths. Everything was said with great exaggeration, with great excess. And one of the people who complains about this is Stefan Zweig in his novel, The World of Yesterday. I am an impatient and temperamental reader. Every redundance, all embellishment, and anything vaguely rapturous, everything nebulous and unclear, whatever tends to retard a novel, irritates me. Nine-tenths of the books that happen into my hands are too greatly expanded by superfluous description, talky dialogue, and unnecessary minor characters, hence fail in magnetism and dynamic power. Even in the most celebrated classics, the many sandy and dragging passage disturb me. And often, I have laid before publishers the bold notion of a comprehensive series of the literature of the world from Homer to Balzac and Dostoevsky to the Magic Mountain, thoroughly curtailing the superfluous in each. Then all of those works, whose timeless value is undoubted, could acquire new life and influence in our day. So Zweig was um, uncomfortable with this great excess of the, um, of the romantic novels, of the 19th century novel. Um, his, uh, the spirit, at least, of Zweig's suggestion to shorten and compress the, um, the great novels is nowadays adopted by high school students when preparing for their exams. But in Zweig's time, in the early 20th century, many artists and many writers and many musicians um, took um, these kind of ideas and this kind of response to romanticism and, and used it to create a new style. So the neoclassicism was taking this sort of dense um, way of saying things in, the rom in, the, in romanticism and just cleaning it, presenting something which was much cleaner, much more transparent. And Dadaism uh, was, a, was rebelling against the extreme seriousness of the romantic period um, with a very irreverent sense of humour. Another approach was to take things and just go for the very, very bare bones, for the simplest of the simple. One of the people who does this best in art is the Dutch artist Piet Mondrian. Here in this picture, um, painted in 1906, Mondrian draws a, well, quite typical, it's, still qu it's quite clean in itself, but a uh, clear picture of, the, um, of a um, pier and a beach at uh, sunset. That's in 1906. If we go three years forward to the year in which Webern wrote his five pieces, he, Mondrian is drawing exactly the same thing. The dunes with, with a beach and piers, um, and that's 1909. And now, well, we can vaguely see that there's a sea, uh, that it's a seascape, but it's much, it's much more abstract. And it's, um, he's really interested in the way things flow. Let's go a few years forward to 1915. And this is the same thing, <laughs> just a grid of lines, straight lines, um, uh, horizontal and vertical lines representing exactly the same thing. Mondrian is taking us to the bare bones. He wants the most concise expression of what he's, uh, and we can see the way he's been looking for, for that concise expression in the, um, in the earlier works as well as part of a process. Anton Webern was the biggest representative of getting things, of going to the concise and short um, in, in, within the Second Viennese School. His complete works fit onto five or six CDs alone. You can buy all his works in one um, album. And some of his movements last no longer than 15 seconds or half a minute, uh, two and a half minutes. The longest movement that we're going to hear in the um, five pieces for string quartet is going to be two and a half minutes long. And the whole five pieces are over within nine minutes. So those of you who are dreading the pieces, well, <laughs> at least you know that. Um, 
But um, conciseness was the thing for him, really not rebelling against the romanticism in, its, um, in the way it says things, but just compressing everything into the most concise and tight fragments possible. Um, when he wrote one of his early works, early short works, the Bagatelles for String Quartet, um, his teacher, Arnold Schoenberg, responded in the following way to this conciseness of the piece. Just as the brevity of these pieces speaks in their favour, even so it is necessary to speak in favour of this brevity. Think of the concision which expression in such brief form demands. Every glance is a poem, every sigh a novel. But to achieve such concentration, to express a novel in a single gesture, a great joy in a single breath, every trace of sentimentality must be correspondingly banished. So every sigh is a novel, every glance is a poem, or the other way around, it doesn't really matter. He's got to express a whole world within a tiny, tiny fragment. Let's look at the notes, what we played to you before, and see how he gets that done. So we're going to play the first uh, six measures of the movement and then take a good look at them. What's going on here? Let's take a look at the score for a moment. Within the score, you'll notice that apart from the musical notes, he's got a hell of a lot to say about everything. Every single note has a dynamics marking next to it. That's fortissimo there, fortissimo, um, forte here, pianissimo there. He's got something to tell us about every single note, how, how loud to play that note. Now, for the sake of comparison, let's look at the viola part from the beginning of the Haydn Quartet that we played earlier. Can you see how many letters there are there? One. Just one, right? Play it piano, play it softly. That's all Haydn has to tell us. He doesn't need control, he needs us to play a whole theme from beginning to end. Schubert, well, with Schubert there's a bit more drama going on. Um, about, I'd say, one dynamics marking per measure or per two measures. So he's got more to tell us, but still he's taking us on a pretty clear journey from one spot to the other, using the dynamics to tell us where to go. But with Webern, oh boy, every single note. And not only does he have things to tell us every single note, but look at the range. Three fortes, three pianos. Um, at some point, we even have four pianos. It pianississimo. I don't even know how you say it. There's, there isn't even a word for it. Um, so what he's doing is he's, he's got to capture what Schubert had to capture in a whole phrase, he's got to capture in one note. He's got to get it all in there within one note. But apart from that, in, to get maximum information and maximum expression, he's got to control not only the, um, the dynamics, but also the way we produce sound. So the first notes um, played on the, second, on the second violin and cello are played normally with the bow. And when Rachel and I answer, we answer pizzicato. And the next notes are played collegno, with the wood of the bow. And he continues to explore these colours throughout, um, throughout the piece and throughout that section. For instance, he tells us to play am Steg, um, which is on the bridge. Um, where is that? Sorry, I just... Over there. On the bridge. And that gives us a sort of uh, glassy sound. Um, and finally, the last note that we heard in this section, um, the one right here at the, at the end, over there, is what we call a flageolet, a sort of whistle. In a way, he's giving maximum attention to all the tiny details, and that's why his music is compared to, to pointillism, uh, the school of art founded by Seurat, uh, where pictures are given a shimmering surface by the use of very, very small dots. If we look closer, that's the um, clown who's walking in there. It's just these tiny, tiny dots that create the figure. Um, 
it's an interesting comparison, but I'm not sure just how much insight it really gives us on what Webern is doing, because really Webern is giving a lot of attention to the small fragments as well, and not only to the way they shimmer on the surface. Now, apart from the attention to dynamics and the attention to ways of producing sound, that he's also got to have very concise musical ideas that we can easily recognize and, and that he can easily um, adapt. So one idea that he presents early on in the, in the first movement is this sort of zigzagging theme, a, a theme with four notes. Da -di -da -dum, da -di -da -dum. He presents it on the cello. Let's hear it. So we had two upward zigzags, do -de -do -dum, and then de -do -do -dum, this bigger zigzag going from top to bottom. And Webern takes these, these um, little themes, these little fragments, and presents them in different, in different ways. So for instance, the rising zigzag, do -de -do -dum, appears on the second violin in pizzicato. And then it becomes a sort of lilting Viennese dance in the viola. It's the same four nodes. And if you noticed, I finished off with this. Um, that was the downwards zigzag. And that is taken as another um, fragment that he uses. For instance, in the following place where we all play it pizzicato, um, plucking the strings. So through the condensing of material, the use of these little, little motivic cells and the extreme attention to colouring, to the colour of each note, to the dynamics of each note, um, Webern creates a short movement, two and a half minutes, in which he says as much as Mahler would have said in 45 minutes. That's the basic idea. And I think we've always got to remember that, um, that it's the romantic model that we're looking at. It's the way... We have a huge romantic symphony that's just compressed. Let's, let's listen to the first movement. We'll play the whole thing later. Just the first movement now with these things in mind.
The second movement is a song which is performed first on the viola and later on um, on the two violins, a beautiful lyrical song with a um, very, very expressive theme. Now, despite its, its great expressiveness and despite the fact that Webern tells us on every single note what to do, it never rises above the dynamic of piano, soft. And in fact, there are only two places where it actually, reach, where it actually reaches piano, and the rest of the movement is pianissimo and pianissimo. It's all whispered. Um, the movement itself is, is a miracle, I'd say, of mood, uh, a miracle in which um, Webern manages in, in less than two minutes of music to create this amazing stillness. We'll leave that movement to later to the entire performance, but in the third movement, what I'd like to um, point out is the form, the way Webern, in 40 seconds of music, and that's all we have there, in 40 seconds of music manages to give us a complete two-part form. What happens is the music starts off with a, um, a steady rhythm on the cello and with a lot of special glassy colours on the rest of the instruments. The music um, eventually tires out and gets slower, and then, it, and then in the second part it ex accelerates to the end and explodes. So it just gets slower and eventually gets faster and bang at the end. Now, to, to help us mark the parallel between the two parts, Webern introduces a little tune, a very sweet little tune that the first violin plays at the, towards the end of the first part. That, that's all, just that simple little tune. And that same tune appears right at the end. After we got all excited, we all yell it out together. That was ti da dum ba di da 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 dum. So we'll play you this movement now from beginning to end. 40 seconds, you can look at your stopwatches. Um, when we played this movement to kids, um, a lot of them did sit with their stopwatches, um, but uh, it was actually a, a movement that really caught them. And my kids, when they get into the car, I, I listen to this piece a lot while we were preparing this concert. When they get into the car now, they say, we want to hear Webern, meaning this, this movement. It's a, that's the movement that really, really grabs them. There's a good lesson to be learned there, because we all come with a lot of expectations. We know what we like, we know what we don't like. But children, well, they're a lot more open, and atonal music is much easier to explain to, to children, much, e much easier to present to children than it is for adults. So let's get rid of the, that sort of e expectations of tonality and the comfort of, of tonality, and give Webern a go. So here's the third movement. There you are. <laughs> he really knows how to, uh, how to create an atmosphere. It's just an explosion, 40 seconds, but boy does he create a, a powerful piece in that time. The fourth movement is another slow, hushed movement. And here, Webern creates a three-part form, an ABA form. The, the way we can follow the music here is by the characteristics of A versus B and seeing where the music goes. So the A part has these shimmering sounds and these plucked sounds that, that, uh, that punctuate the music with this sort of pointillistic sur surface like we described before. And then we have this um, imitation between the first violin and the cello. Then we move to part B. Part B is characterized by a beautiful song played on the first violin, accompanied by a repeated three-note figure on the viola. A 
100% atmosphere. And then we move into the last part where, once again, we have the shimmering colors and the imitations between the instruments. The whole thing takes two minutes. If you want more help in following where we move from part A to part B and part B back to part A, then at the end of each part, Webern gives us a very clear marker with this rising figure, which just sort of um, flies into the air at the end. We'll hear that at the end of the first part, at the end of A. We'll hear it at a slower version of it at the end of B, and once again at the end of the movement, at the end of the re repeat of A. To the last movement. Well, in the last movement, Webern reminds us that he's Viennese and he likes to waltz. But this is a very sad waltz. Webern tells us that he wrote this piece with a memory of his mother who had died three years earlier. Now, I'm, I'm not sure whether he, that was an afterthought, whether he wrote the piece and then thought that this would be a good thing to say or whether he genuinely wrote it. But the fact that he said it means that he wanted us to see this piece once again as a romantic piece, like Puccini, a piece which expresses his, his sentiments, expresses what's going on inside. And in the waltz that we hear in the last movement, a very still and sad waltz, the cello who plays this lilting theme eventually gets lost and, and doesn't really manage to dance to the right rhythm. Boy, can he create an atmosphere, a sense of endlessness in a piece that has such short movements. But that's what it's all about. It's all about grasping the endless sense of romanticism in zero time. And what could possibly be better for people in our time when we've got to check email in, in maximum 10 minutes anyway? I'm not sure how many of you will be able to love Webern at, at first hearing now when we, when we play the entire piece. Um, in a way, it's, it's a piece and, and, and a style that, takes, that, that is an acquired taste. It takes a few efforts and a few times to hear the piece before it, becomes, before it feels familiar and before we find our way in. Those of you who will have heard Webern before, I hope that I've um, helped you um, enjoy the piece now. And those of you who haven't and might find it at times a little difficult, well, I hope that we at least have created some sense of curiosity and a wish to hear more of what this wonderful composer has to say, because this piece is, for me, one of the great masterpieces for string quartet, which is a, I think we all feel it's a true privilege for us to play and a great privilege for us to present to you. Webern's Five Pieces for String Quartet. Thank you.